Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Whitney, and welcome to uh, the panel uh, on immersive uh, cinematic space, uh, which is being convened um, the second to last weekend of Dreamlands. And thank you all for coming, and thank you to this wonderful uh, panel that has come to discuss issues raised by uh, the exhibition. Um, today we saw a kind of pretty violent and sudden banning of citizens from Middle Eastern countries into the US. And that very sort of sudden act reminds us of the physicality of geography and borders. Dreamlands opened before the election and it closes just after. The show begins in Weimar, Germany. Um, it shows some of the experiments uh, with um, artistic experimentation. It appeared just before artistic freedom um, and travel and everything else we know was shut down. Keeping borders open is critical for our world and also for culture. And it's, it's critical to continue to assert artistic voices of every kind moving forward in this bizarre new situation we're in. The panel today uh, that we're all going to be participating in, hopefully, considers immersive space as part of both the historical evolution of cinema and how immersive uh, cinematic experience occurs in the work of, of current artists. I'm delighted to have uh, key scholars in the field, two of the artists from Dreamlands, our collaborators from Microscope Gallery on the expanded cinema program, Dreamlands Expanded. Uh, and the order of the speakers is going to be myself giving just a few thoughts, introductory thoughts, and then Noam Alcott, Juliana Bruno, Dora Budo, Josiah McElhenney, Andrea Monti, and El Burchill. And I'm going to introduce every speaker as they speak, and then we'll open up uh, the panel for a discussion between us, and then open it up to you. So I just wanted to start by uh, with a few thoughts. I mean, I curated Dreamlands in response to what felt like a, a rapid sea change that was occurring in art at a moment in which our environment's being radically transformed by technology, producing a kind of all-surrounding, all-surveyed sensorium in which cyberspace has come to determine the contours of everything, from military strategy and economics to politics, architecture, social and intimate relationships, entertainment, the body and visual perception. In this new reality, pluralistic models of visuality are profoundly altering the ways in which space is constructed, con controlled, and experienced. As Hito Stoll has argued, the global redistribution of perspective onto a vertical aerial axis of surveillance and control has created a, quote, disembodied, post-humanized gaze, outsourced to machines and other objects, end quote. Within this vertiginous destabilizing of space, predominant forms of image making are transitioning to what might call a physiological to virtual optics. The show brings together a group of artists and filmmakers who work, whose work articulates this profound shift through a broad engagement with cinematic space. But this is not a show about cinema. Rather, it takes cinema's role as a discursive site of visual perception, a point of entry, to explore the impact of the transition from the spatial to what Jens Schroeter has termed the transplanar image, by which he means the shift of the image from a two-dimensional plane depicting space in cinema, the rectangle or the screen of the screen, to a multiplanar surface that opens, opens up the optical border between two and three-dimensional space, intensifying our perception of both and replacing perspectival looking with a kind of beholding, if you like. In physical space, the interplanar cinematic environment becomes a portal into new readings of space, surface, time, materiality, identity, and corporal presence. The dominance of a photographically based narrative cinema has, has obscured the importance of this haptic model in map mapping successive new conceptualizations of human subjectivity. Now, as the camera's efficacy is receding, modified by CGI, artificial intelligence, and virtual and augmented reality, 
the immersive cinematic space has become a potent model for the spatial visualization of multiple new po uh, identities, perspectives, and imaginative possibilities through which new technology is rendering our visual future. This new model is as fluid as the experiences to which it gives form. It erases the horizon line, flattens space through animation and abstraction, or heightens the illusion of three-dimensionality through color, 3D, physical objects, interplanar structures, and special effects. It dismantles the elements by which cinema is conven conventionally constituted, projection, apparatus, film, the frontal rectangular screen, darkness, immobility, cin cinematography, linear narrative, and reassembles them in new forms that are in many cases barely recognizable as having any relationship to cinema at all. It recalibrates our experience of visual surface as tactile materiality and reframes our perception of reality through a haptic recalibration of the relationship between the body, architecture, science, AI, and science fiction. The cyborg is an important element of the show. It populates science, medicine, sex, and war. In the, in, in the cinematic spaces of this show, its, pre its presence similarly addresses production, reproduction, and the erasure of binaries through haptic encounters with the boundary of what constitutes the biological and the technological, the fictive, and the real. In our current 24-7 environment, perpetuated by a society in which we're all disposable units, deprived, as Jonathan Crary argues, of the full withdrawal through sleep that allows pause, and perhaps dissent from consumerism and surveillance. The spaces in, in dreamlands unfold like a map of interior dimensional dreaming, perhaps echoing Pasolini, Pasolini's idea of cinema as a structure in motion, a text in progress, a dynamic form, always trying to be, striving to be another form. So I'd like to introduce our panel and um, the first speaker is Noam Alcott, who is Associate Professor of Modern and Contemporary Art and Media at Columbia University. Uh, Noam works with an emphasis on interwar art, photography, and film. He is co-editor of the journal Grey Room, which brings together scholarly and theoretical articles from the fields of architecture, art, media, and politics. I'd also like to draw your attention to this um, very quickly put together extraordinary um, grey room issue, post-election artist dossier, um, which is shortly to be um, made available, certainly in our bookshop and hopefully everywhere else. Very, very important and very swift reaction to the election. Uh, Noam's writings appeared in journals including October and Aperture, as well as a number of museum catalogues and scholarly volumes, including uh, writing a wonderful catalogue text for, for the Dreamlands um, catalogue, Bodies in the Dark, Cinemas, Spectatorship, Discipline and Residue. His book, Artificial Darkness, A History of Modern Art and Media, is the 2017 winner of the Society for Cinema and Media Studies and Friedberg Innovative Scholarship Award. And he's currently working on his second book, Art in the First Screen Age, Laszlo Maholi Naj, and the Cinification of the Arts. And Noam's a very important um, uh, mentor and um, wonderful colleague and friend and discussant through, throughout the development of Dreamlands and an essential um, part of the exhibition. So welcome, Noam. Thank you. Thank you. Um. Hmm. There go. The, uh, thank you so much and on, on two several levels. First, mentor certainly not, but interlocutor absolutely. And of course, it's a two, uh, the dialogue is a uh, works in two directions. So I have learned so much uh, through you over the years, um, and I'd say my entire scholarly project is barely imaginable without the work that you've done. So uh, this is an incredible treat. Um, the treat part I'll come back to in a second. The, the darker part, of course, is clear as well, and it's, it does seem essential to mark this moment that we began this, we planned this uh, uh, panel. The exhibition, of course, launched all in a different world. and. Uh, I think we're have, we will likely have a very similar conversation to the conversation we would have had two months ago, and yet we shouldn't. So just marking that um, uh, seems vital at this moment. I'm going to jump right into uh, my very uh, our, our scant 10 minutes, um, and uh, and we'll see what type of new connections we're able uh, to make as as necessary. We are here to discuss 
immersive cinema and art. And I'm here to argue that several qualitatively different types of immersion are in evidence in Chrissy's extraordinary exhibition. Indeed, among the innumerable contributions this exhibition makes to our understanding of art, cinema, and modernity, it is an exemplary showcase of radically different, albeit related, immersive environments. For the sake of brevity, I'll borrow a media theoretical shorthand to describe the mix of technologies, techniques, architectures, institutions, and images that constitute each of these environments. The term is dispositif, and it describes the delivery mechanisms of images. It's a complex term, it's a foreign term, it's got a long history, but in shorthand, and simply, it is the delivery mechanism of images, the total apparatus that delivers images to us. I'll address three dispositives in particular, what I call the cinematic, the domestic, and the phantasmagoric. This typology advances from the media archaeological observation that certain types of images thrive best in certain types of locations and not in others. Three media dis dispositives that promote and inhibit specific types of images in specific types of locations. Each dispositif is internally multifaceted and externally porous to other dispositifs. Claims to their coherence and strict delineation are heuristic. But violations of these boundaries have real consequences, aesthetic, social, economic, perhaps even political. Once again, the three dis dispositifs may be distinguished as the cinematic, the domestic, and the phantasmagoric. And I'm going to run through them. Try it. <laughs> Just try the soup. Is it too hot? Try it. Is it too cold? Try it. Okay. Where's the spoon? Aha. Okay. The. Uh... Okay. We'll do this old school. Next slide. Let's go back a slide, please. Uh, the cinematic is an emblematic instance of what Joachim Pech describes as the experience of proximity affected through distance. Cinema places us in the film by displacing us from the auditorium. As an architecture system or dispositif that affects proximity through distance, the cinematic arose wholly independent of film. Conversely, in their first decade, like today, movies were not inextricably bound to purpose-built theaters. So the cinematic is not just cinema. It precedes cinema in my somewhat counterintuitive reading. Radical spatial dislocation and separation constituted one of the core qualities of 19th century attractions. So let's get some slides. Barker's panorama and also Daguerre's diorama, the Kaiser panorama, which is stereopticon. Next slide, please. The kinetoscope, yet another. And the cinema of Edison and Lumiere brothers, and above all, Wagner's theater at Bayreuth, which, as the maestro asserted in his 1849 essay, The Artwork of the Future, enabled, quote, the public, that representative of daily life, to disappear from the auditorium completely. Let's try the next slide. There we go. As all moviegoers know, when the lights are extinguished, we do not remain in the dark, but rather forget the confines of our environment and project ourselves into the film. In the words of the, of the surrealist poet and cinephile Robert Deneau, quote, the hall and spectators disappear. Proximity affected through distance is the hallmark of, the, of cinema as a dispositif. Cinematic immersion necessitates the displacement of spectators from their bodies and their environment. So this is the first type of immersion I want to address. Cinematic immersion, I'm arguing, necessitates the displacement of spectators from their own bodies and from their environment. Next slide. Oh, and one more. That was invisible cinema. Consider, on the other hand, the opposite experience, the experience of TV, which also shows films. Nothing, no fascination, the darkness is dissolved, the anonymity repressed, the space is familiar, organized by furniture and familiar objects, tamed. Thus Roland Barthes compares cinema and television, the signature media of the cinematic and domestic dispositifs. The domestic dispositif is anti-immersive. The domestic implies not only the home, but as betrayed by its noun form, a household servant, a domestic or domestique. 
Whether at home, at work, or on the move, we are pampered and besieged by devices that ring and vibrate, speak and listen, take and stream and play videos. They know where we are and remind us what to do and respond to our commands. They facilitate and carry out our virtual work, survey nearly every facet of our lives, and perform innumerable other tasks once carried out by domestics. Domestic media devices thus most readily earn their name in the present, but they reach back to the 19th century salon, which harbor not only paintings and prints, but phenakistoscopes, praxinoscopes, and other optical toys. The domestic is also the middle class living room where television made its home, first as furniture, later as hearth. Domestic are the tract houses, apartment complexes, and McMansions littered with computers, tablets, phones, and other devices for the consumption of media content, not least though quite nearly least, movies. Domestic are the ever-increasing number of galleries from the 1960s to the present in which, another, one more, altered television sets by Nam June Pike, ornate celluloid loops by Simon Starling, and the cinematic and videographic sculptures of countless other, others found quarters and eventually buyers who bring the works home. In the domestic, cinema is an optical toy, a piece of furniture, a book, a sculpture, in a word, an object. Accordingly, it is placed among other objects. Crucial is that the devices like televisions do not create the same sense of placelessness as cinema. What is more, in the domestic dispositif, moving images are objects that, like nearly all capitalist objects, are made to be bought and sold. The domestic houses commodities. In the domestic, cinema finds a place as a commodity. Its vernacular forms range from toys to televisions and other electronic or digital gadgets. Its culturally exalted forms we call artworks. Like the cinematic and the domestic, the phantasmagoric is neither medium specific nor platform agnostic. Unlike cinema and television, phantasmagoria never attained a classical form or a normative discourse. Indeed, the phantasmagoric dispositif emerges uncomfortably alongside the cinematic and the domestic. It is less familiar, but by no means less important, to contemporary spectators and viewers. Indeed, I believe it is the phantasmagoric dispositif that pervades Dreamlands so successfully, and it is the breadth and depth of Dreamlands engagement with phantasmagoria that makes it such a powerful prismatic lens through which to view our present and the centuries that enabled it. So what is the phantasmagoric? Let's begin with what it was. Coined at the end of the 18th century, the phantasmagoria, as its name announced, assembled ghosts, specifically lantern slides projected on visible smoke or invisible screens suspended in dark spaces. And that immediately should resonate with what everyone has seen upstairs. These images were unmoored from their material supports and occupied the same dark space as spectators. The original phantasmagorias were developed by enlightened showmen and duplicitous necromancers such as Johann Schripfer, Paul Philidor, and most famously Etienne Gaspar Robertson. Their most important descendant was the mid-19th century attraction Pepper's Ghost. Pepper's Ghost is the basis for nearly all the recent applications erroneously dubbed holographic. Augmented reality spectacle eyewear such as Microsoft HoloLens and Google Glass, as well as mass spectacles for live and mediated audience such as the 2012 Coachella concert featuring Tupac Shakur, murdered in 1996, 16 years before he appeared on stage with Snoop Dogg, Dr. Dre, and other flesh and blood stars, and the 2014 resurrection of Michael Jackson at the Billboard Music Awards, where he performed a new song, quote unquote, live on stage. Over the course of 220 years, we have exchanged Robespierre and the Revolution for Tupac and hip hop, the slayer of kings for the king of pop, but the techno-spatial configuration of phantasmagoria that is the phantasmagoric dispositif has remained surprisingly stable. In phantasmagorias, media images are not radically separated from hum human bodies. That is the domain of the cinematic. Nor are the images contained within objects as in the domestic. In the original 18th century phantasmagorias and their contemporary descendants, human beings and images are assembled in a common space and time. 
Whether these human beings are credulous dupes or highly trained actors is of little consequence. Phantasmagorias are highly efficacious. We need not believe in ghosts to perceive phantasmagoric images. But phantasmagorias are also highly precarious. Here, cinema is strategically emplaced like a weapon to be deployed with unerring precision or risk exposure and failure. Phantasmagoria is a matter of performance, or more broadly, theater, where living beings and mediated, and mediated images can assemble. Emblematic would be the modulation of body and artificial darkness in Oscar Schlemmer's abstract dances or Anthony McCall's line describing a cone which, like the original 18th century phantasmagorias, is a projection onto smoke or mist. And look especially in the central image, uh, or the top right central image in this slide on the left, uh, where you can see a projection of a ghost onto smoke. Uh, McCall's line describing a cone is basically 18th century visual technology applied to 20th century abstraction, or maybe the other way around. Uh, Hitostero's Factory of the Sun, uh, which collapses the virtual space on screen in the virtualizing space of the gallery come motion capture studio, or Josiah McElhaney's projection paintings, where ghostly traces of voodoo enter our four-dimensional space-time continuum at the very boundaries of painting, sculpture, and cinema. Collectively, these and related works plot the twin dissolutions at the core of the exhibition at least as I understand it, and contemporary visual experience more broadly. First, the confusion of humans and technologized images or surrogates. This is the cyborg through line. Second, the confusion of humans and their environments. This is the immersion through line. For more than two centuries, the phantasmagoric dispositif has facilitated these dual dissolutions. Dreamlands grants the art public a chance to explore the politics and poetics of phantasmagoria in the ways that matter most, in their own bodies, in their own time, and in their own space. Bodies, times, and spaces that have merged with the world of images. Thank you. Thank you, Noam. And now uh, I'd like to introduce Juliana Bruno, who is a professor in the Department of Visual and Environmental Studies at Harvard University. Juliana is internationally known for her research on the intersections of the visual arts, architecture, film, and media. Her seminal body of work, Atlas of Emotion, Journeys in Art, Architecture, and Film from 2002 won the Krasner Krauss Book Award for the world's best book on the moving image. In her latest book, Surface, Matters of Aesthetics, Materiality, and Media, 2014, she revisits the concept of materiality in the contemporary art world. Juliana has contributed to numerous monographs on contemporary artists, including Isaac Julian's Riot for the Museum of Modern Art and Chantal Ackerman's Too Far Too Close. And Juliana wrote the essay, uh, The Screen as Object, Art and the Atmospheres of Projection for the Dreamlands Catalog. So thank you, Juliana. Thank you, Chrissy. Um, very much for this uh, very thought-provoking, interesting, exciting exhibition and for this invite and to Megan Hoyer too for putting together this fabulous panel of people. It was great to listen to you, Noam, and I look forward to, to dialogue with every one of you today. Um, and uh, since we're doing this the old-fashioned way, thank you. <laughs> I, um, I'm interested, uh, as Noam was, in many aspects of immersion, and I would actually say also absorption uh, that this exhibition is presenting us with. And perhaps we can talk about some of these uh, differences as well as overlaps between these two uh, concepts. But for the sake of sticking to the topic of the panel, the spaces of cinema in the short period of time we have, I decided to focus a little bit on uh, the idea of the space of projection and uh, overlaps uh, much in, uh, you know, in tune with Noam, with whom I share a lot of elective affinities, uh, relations between uh, media archaeology, previous forms of conception of the cinematic in pre-cinema with what's happening in the art gallery uh, and in the museum uh, today. So uh, the screen uh, as a place of luminous passage, uh, filter of light, sculptural, architectural object, I think is very prominent in this uh, exhibition, and that interests me in particular. And also the 
a sensory environment, the atmosphere, the ambience um, of projection, the material um, space uh, is brought uh, to light here, uh, including the movement, the place of spectators uh, in this space of immersion and absorption. Um, I want to reflect first on the reflective uh, surface of the screen to start and do a little bit of media archaeology on that. Uh, we tend to think of screens as something technological um, that arise with the invention of cinema. Uh, that's really not the case. The notion, the function, the object of the screen is in fact uh, much older uh, than all of that, even going um, all further back than the 19th century. In fact, the word screen was used uh, for the first time in late Middle Ages, early Renaissance, uh, from a Germanic root, scrim, the transfer to many languages, screen in English, écran in French, schermo in Italian, and so on and so forth. And it's a notion that actually comes from architecture. Uh, so the screen was much connected to a space uh, before it entered uh, the world of, of pre-cinema and even, and even cinema. It was intended to, it was an object, uh, an object of furniture uh, or an object that was placed in front of windows. So it could be made of translucent fabric or transparent, uh, not never transparent, but it was actually a material. So translucent fabric could be paper, some kind of fabric stretched on a wooden frame, and that would be placed in front of windows or as it is much in Japanese uh, architecture, as a folding screen or a, or a scrolling screen would, uh, would actually separate uh, and connect the zones of privacy uh, in the domestic space. So the screen's function as a space was always as, a board, as something to connect uh, and cross uh, spaces and borders and relate inside and outside privacy and publicity. Uh, in, uh, uh, in, in space, and it is precisely, I think, uh, this particular function and meaning which transferred to the 19th century. So it was in place for centuries, from the Renaissance all the way to the, to the 19th century, that transferred to 19th century's uh, ways of, of incorporating this particular material, this visual fabric, and which became a plane for the transmission of luminous images, a different kind of texture and materiality transfer from that kind of uh, translucent material into uh, what we now know being the reflective uh, surface of the screen. And I think one of the things that interests me in particular about the exhibition and the work of the artists who are are present here is the sculptural and architectural function of the screen, which I think you know, comes from this media archeological uh, period and has decon deconstructed, rethought, reinvented uh, in the work that certainly uh, both of you do, uh, you in terms of an environment, Dora, and you, Josiah, in terms of the actual sculpting you know, of, the, of the material fabric of the screen in the work you have in the exhibition, but also in some of the other work that you've done, uh, uh, that you've done uh, in, uh, in, your own, in your own career. So um, it is this uh, sculptural and architectural function that also uh, I think is present in Ito Sterl, uh, work in the exhibition uh, Factory of the Sun from 2015, where, where there's a kind of reconfiguration in a, uh, in a way of the, of the, of the, the space, uh, which is actually really the space of cinema in, uh, in some form, and of the, of the, of the spectators as they, are, uh, as they are relating to this, uh, to the screen. So I want to, uh, taking a clue from this, emphasize actually the architecture of the experience, the ambience, the atmosphere of projection, uh, and relate this kind of contemporary reconfiguration to uh, an aspect of film uh, and architecture theory that has been uh, less studied than it should be, which is the architecture of film theaters themselves. I'm interested in seeing what experimental uh, expanded cinema uh, situations, but especially the architecture of film theater has to, has to tell us about the art gallery turned um, into, uh, into uh, a cinematic space or a space for projection, let's say, of, of moving images. So I want to quickly look at a few iconic um, uh, uh, historical precedents, mostly from New York City, since we are here, so that seemed uh, site-specific uh, and appropriate, and beginning with, of course, uh, Friedrich Kiesler's uh, Film Guild Cinema, which was uh, designed by the visionary architect uh, in 1928. Um, 
in New York City, um, because Kiesler was an architect that actually architected the screen uh, and made it into a sculptural object. Uh, the screen was uh, a, a place, it was a, a kinetic object. It moved, it expanded and contracted uh, mechanically as if it was inside not just of an eye, but of a mechanical eye, the eye of a camera. But what I'm also interested in is that he, uh, he designed what he called a screenoscope. And it's the scope of projection is evident there because it was not only this, this, this object that moved, but also it was supposed to expand to the sides. Uh, so it's not frontality here. Uh, even in 1928, in this experimental uh, way of thinking about the space of projection, and, and so it was supposed to expand to the side. And then he also was thinking uh, about something he called the projectoscope, which would extend the projection all the way through the ceiling of the, of the space itself. So this was a space of, of absorption uh, into, uh, into a kind of uh, uh, ambience and architecture of cinema, which created what I like to call a surface uh, cinema or a surface space of, of projection. And in the way in which he talked about the, um, the Film Guild cinema in an, in an article and said, the film is a play on surface. The theater is a play in space. The spectator must be able to lose himself in an imaginary, endless space. Um, moving along uh, to the invisible cinema, early 70s, uh, New York City, again in the public theater, uh, designed by the experimental filmmaker Peter uh, Kubelka. I could not resist uh, talking about this because Chris and I, in the wonderful conversations we had leading up to the exhibition, which was one of the greatest pleasures of working on, uh, on this with you, had endless uh, conversation with the hypothesis of being able to reproduce a version of this uh, somewhere. So I think it should have a place, at least in this panel. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, this is a space that's been much talked about in relation to avant-garde and experimental cinema. But what I want to suggest here is something else. Uh, I'm kind of looking at this with the eyes of today, and uh, and uh, and and I think in some way it it sort of anticipates or speaks about some of the contemporary experience of the screen that we have in our own life, uh, everyday life today. And, and so let's think about it for a second. The surroundings are screened. Uh, we're sheeted, uh, protected, and sheltered inside this uh, velvet space, uh, totally absorbed in the activity uh, looking at a lit screen. Uh, well, I'm, I don't know about you, but uh, I, uh, every week, take the Amtrak train from New York to Boston, and I, I feel exactly the same way. I, don't, I, I have shields uh, in front of me everywhere, and I'm looking at my screen, and, but I'm sitting in a public space with perfect strangers, totally isolated, but at the same time in a kind of community of strangers, same way when you go into a cafe or any other public space where this form of public intimacy, I like to call it, is in fact you know, enacted in the way in which we are uh, connected and relating to, uh, to the screen in, in a kind of architecture of public intimacy, creating contact and being in touch through our screen uh, in that particular way. So on the one hand, this kind of miniaturized, you know, obsessive <laughs> experience of being sheeted and sheltered. Uh, and on the other uh, end of the spectrum, the gigantic, the environments of projection, the, the kind of the ambience uh, of, of projections, and where, you know, where, uh, where the borders uh, become endless, uh, and especially with the revive of things like uh, 3D technologies, IMAX, not to speak of virtual reality. Well, if we're looking back uh, into kind of um, um, not even a media archaeological past, but in the, again, the same year that Kiesler uh, designed the, the film Guild Cinema in 1928, in 1929, John Eberson designs this theater in the Bronx, the Lowe's Paradise Theater um, in the Bronx. And uh, he calls it atmospheric theater. Um, yeah, he designed a number of atmospheric uh, theaters. Uh, and what I'm interested in here is that atmosphere and the atmosphere of projection is something that it 
contains the screen. So the screen is not just the object there. It's the object inside an environment, an ambience, an entire total experience that includes you, uh, the spectator, sitting in these kinds of elaborate you know, types of, of architecture. But it also means um, it, it meant atmosphere uh, in the 19th century uh, uh, version. So this was Stimmung. It was Afa. It was an atmosphere as the creation of a material atmosphere, a tonality, a tone, a mood, uh, creating an affect uh, in, in many different ways, a sentiment, a state of mind. Um, the, and that was also created by crossing borders. The borders between inside and outside are fluid here. You're sitting in an inside space, and it, it's as if you were in an Italian garden, an elaborate Italian garden. And there were also, it was a light show, so you had uh, you had a ceiling that was totally perfectly lit, and then slowly, slowly, as if the whole day of the environmental experience of light and space would condense, then stars would come up, and then the screen would come up as a perfect you know, white uh, surface emerging from these kinds of distractive, uh, immersive uh, environments. So in, in this particular way, the surround space, you know, it reminds me also of, this, of, the, of the experience of, of being in an IMAX uh, theater. <clears throat> the, so speaking of surround uh, screens, of course, the atmosphere is a projection of expanded cinema, in, 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 and you have an example of that in the, in the Stan van der Beek's movie drone uh, in the exhibition, uh, uh, but I want to. But I want to spend a couple of minutes, one whatever is left. No, no, no. That uh, speaking about another uh, another space of projection of Stan van der Beek uh, steam screens, which uh, was conceived together with the uh, the artist uh, John Brigham, uh, who was a pioneer of of steam uh, of steam art and which was shown first in the Whitney Museum in the Sculpture Garden in 1979 and was reproduced in the Whitney Expanded uh, uh, thing, uh, part of the program uh, of the exhibition at the Knockdown Center in, in Queens for, for the exhibition. So this, to me, was an experience of uh, an actual atmosphere, what I mean by also atmosphere, which was also environmental, you know, reminding me of, of, of Robert Morris' uh, early work of land art. Uh, this it created a total ambience of projection uh, that atmospherically was clouded with particles of light, uh, water, and, and, and air. And um, Bri John Brigham wrote beautifully about this, and I, I cited at length in my catalog essay, uh, saying how clouds enhance vision, they do not obscure it. And because uh, she conceived clouds uh, and, the, and the work itself, the performance of this atmosphere of projection to act on, and I quote, surfaces, distances, textures, and volumes, the factors by which we orient ourselves in time and space. And she would also add that the images hover in mid-air like apparitions in mid-air. So in this respect, in this vapors uh, of projection, this piece much reminds me of the phantasmagoric mode that Noam has described in his uh, presentation because uh, spectacles of phantasmagoria like today's version of them were hazy and cloudy and even included projections on, on steam. Steam was used as a force of energy and uh, John Brigham said the steam changes the audience, the audience changes uh, the steam. So uh, last but not least, the, the function of, of who's in these environments of projection or uh, in the midst of these environments of hazy projection and again, um, thinking about the cloudy material ambience of projection, I couldn't help thinking of Anthony McCall's solid light uh, films, uh, and uh, in, into which are shown in uh, uh, one of the pieces shown in Chris's uh, exhibition, which span all the way from the 70s uh, to today. He reinvented in digital form this, uh, even the <laughs> even the smoke uh, in uh, in his uh, latest exhibition. So uh, I don't. I want to. Then, uh, have, having spoken of the surrounding space, the light, the screen, and uh, the ambience of projection, not to forget this one last aspect, which is the dancing cone of light uh, that you see in Anthony McCall's piece, which uh, Holland Bart 
uh, wrote beautifully about in speaking about uh, this, the uh, going going to the cinema, not just being leaving. in the cinema and leaving the movie theater. Uh, so the borders being fluid, uh, you know, the film not being the object, but being about moving in and, and out and through uh, these these spaces, which include this, the metropolis. Um, and I'll end with the, a short quote from Roland Barthes' piece. In that opaque cube, one light, the film, the screen. Yes, of course, but also visible and unperceived, that dancing cone which pierces the darkness as a laser beam. We turn our faces towards the currency of a gleaming vibration whose imperious jet brushes our skull, glances off someone's hair, someone's face as in the old hypnotic experiments, we are fascinated. Yes, indeed, in an atmosphere of projection. Thank you. Thank you, Juliana. I'd now like to introduce Dora Boudot. Um, who lives and works in New York, and um, her sculpture, Adaptation of an Instrument, is currently on view in Dreamlands. Dora's work has been including, included in several um, group exhibitions, including Streams of Warm Impertinence at David Roberts Art Foundation in London, the 7th uh, Berlin Biennial at KW in Berlin, Fade In, in Art Gallery Day, the Swiss Institute, and Inhuman at the F uh, Museum Fredericanium in Kassel. Dora uh, has also had solo exhibitions at uh, several places, including the Swiss Institute, New York, Ramak and Crucible, and the New Gallery in Paris. And Dora was uh, awarded the Rima Hort Emerging Art Grant in 2014 and participated in panel discussions at the Judd Foundation, Art Basel Miami Salon, and the Whitney Museum, as well as with me at the Swiss Institute, and at Columbia a week ago, week and a half ago. Some of Dora's forthcoming uh, shows include group exhibitions at the Palais de Tokyo in Paris and K11 Art Museum in Shanghai and the Vienna uh, Biennale in Vienna. So thank you, Dora. Thank you so much, Chrissy, um, for inviting me to participate in the panel and for, uh, for the conversation, which was almost two years in duration uh, in preparation of the show. So I'm going to talk mostly about the ideas that, uh, that are related to my piece in the show, since it's a new production. Uh, and I'm going to try to tie in maybe into some things that Juliana said uh, previously. Um, so my piece is called Adaptation of an Instrument, uh, and it's a dynamic environment that reacts to the frequency and excitation of the moving bodies inside of it. It weaves together film ecologies with dynamic physiological responses. So it kind of acts like a body. If there is uh, activity inside of it, if there is viewer's presence, uh, it will start reacting to it. And also, uh, if it reaches a certain level of excitation, it might inhibit itself and then start from the beginning. Uh, the instrument simultaneously acts as a scientific device utilized to measure and diagnose but also as a system created to produce sensory phenomena occurring between the architectural structure, program, and event, visitor's body being the event. Um, it can also be considered an organism of sorts in which the intruding body resuscitates the biosphere of cinema, uh, continuously adjusting itself to the new impulses. Architectural and cinematic frameworks are also used to explore the relationship of micro and micro scale. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> so speaking about the micro and micro scale uh, of the piece, uh, there is a certain technique which is almost like zooming in and zooming out uh, into the atmosphere, into the weather anomaly, and inside of the body. Next slide. Next one. So I was interested basically in applying these film, uh, film techniques uh, onto the architectural structure uh, and zooming into the neurological processes inside of the body or zooming out towards the atmosphere with the activity continuously being adjusted between them. Uh, next slide. Next. 
uh, acting almost like a camera uh, in Charles and Ray's film, Power of, Powers of Ten, Relative Size of Things and the Significance of Adding a Zero uh, to Any Number. Uh, you can, next slide. The method that, that was used for uh, creation of the piece was actually translation of, uh, of different models that we were looking at with, uh, with the different, um, three different uh, uh, neurologists and the, the way that they uh, monitor and um, visualize and kind of imagine uh, neurological uh, models. So that was used as a uh, um, beginning, let's say, score for the orchestration of the piece uh, that happens inside of the room. Um, so the architecture of light that the visitor's body reanimates. Um, in this image, we can see Alvin Lucier's graphic score for uh, music for the solo performer. Uh, one of the first pieces using uh, electroencephalogram, EEG which is a monitoring method recording electrical activity of the brain uh, that translated alpha brain waves into the sound and activated the instruments uh, through vibration of the loudspeakers uh, around the room. Microscopic scale of this program, of this model uh, of the instrument, uh, models itself, therefore, after neurological pathways of a body, transforming impulses into evolving light systems, pulsing through the walls and sealing of the space. Uh, we can I'll go to the next one. Uh, this is a video. Um, this is, for example, one of the videos we used, uh, which was... Uh, which was a fluorescence imaging of the neural, neural activity of the hydra. Uh, which basically through tracking, um, uh, for tracking the neurons and uh, synaptic connections uh, is used also as a model for understanding of the human brain. Um, these types of, so we kind of used all of these scientific materials and um, tried to create a certain type of score or elements of a score which is in the end functions almost like a musical score uh, which is then translated into uh, into basically this like network of light uh, that is reactive. Uh, the, the, this kind of occurrence happens in between uh, the moving body and the the light uh, of the walls. Uh, something the light being kind of integral to the cinematic image, or what Juliana calls the zero degree um, of the cinematic image. Um, the macroscopic scale, we can go to the next slide. Um, the macroscopic uh, image uh, becomes the scene of anomalous weather. Um, sorry, there is a video as well. The scene of anomalous weather uh, is reanimated when the light ascends into the ceiling. Uh, it's re reanimation of the rain scene from um, Paul Thomas Anderson's film Magnolia, using the actual objects, the, the prop frogs, thousands of prop frogs that were created for the film, uh, as, through, as almost like a triggering, a flickering memory. Uh, reanimation of this cinematic image evolves in constant symbiogenesis between the body and the, and the structure, uh, realizing the structure of feedback and emergence rather than control. I imagined the instrument to function as an ecosystem, composite of bi biological and technological forces in which microscopic and microscopic uh, views of the world are entangled and de dependent. Conceived as associations of actors in this system, both human and non-human actants affect change on each other via hybrid encounters, alliances, and confrontations. Thank you. Thank you, Dora. I'd now like to introduce uh, Josiah McElhenney, uh, who is a New York-based artist and is recognized for his conceptual, conceptually rigorous approach and a physical mastery of materials, uh, including glass. And he explores uh, wide-ranging topics from astronomical cosmology and the infinite to um, 
um, artists from art history, um, including the abstractions, for example, of Hilma F. Klimt, Blinky Paloma's wall paintings, Robert Smithson's crystalline uh, sculptures. Josiah's projection painting, too, is currently on view in Dreamlands, and he is a recipient, recipient of the 2006 MacArthur Fellowship and has had exhibitions at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the Wexner Center for the Arts in Columbus, the Whitechapel Art Gallery in London, and the Rena Sofia in Madrid. He has a forthcoming exhibition with the Madison Square Park Conservancy, which we're looking forward to. So, Thank you, Josiah. I should also say that Josiah um, helped us very much with um, the blue glass that you see in uh, Joseph Cornell's um, Rose Hobart, which is being shown upstairs in a gallery for the first time. <laughs> so thank you for that too, Josiah. So thank thank you. you. Um, well, thank you all for being here and, and uh, honored to be together with all of you. Um, I guess I feel a little bit like Noam that uh, it's we both should have the same conversation we would have had and not. And so I, w I would like to um, just um, point out for me as an artist that this is one of the first exhibitions I've ever been in that um, it might be termed anachronic, that, it's, that it does not say that time only runs in one direction and that time only runs in order. And so today I woke up feeling like we are in the 1930s and I think that that's like not uh, really, really, not, there are people going to jail right this very second in this very city for the same reasons that people were put in jail and murdered in the 30s. Um, and so history and time are not uh, uh, ending and, and they are recycling and they are going back and forth. And this show um, basically, in my opinion, is, is one in which the hierarchy of time is not displayed the way it typically is in an art historical show, where the, even though it's, it, there's some, let's say, uh, scope of 100 years of history in it, it doesn't prioritize and say that the stuff from 100 years ago is no longer here, and that the stuff from today no, does not speak directly in dialogue with the past. So I, for me, like that's, I just feel like pointing that out here at the museum for me is something that is something that I believe is both deeply important way of looking at art, but also it feels like a deeply important political way of approaching the world, and that uh, that uh, that our that frankly that our enemies want us to not believe that, uh, and they want us to forget what happened before, so that we um, so that they can do what they want today. Um, as well, I would also like to say that the, the, the exhibition, I feel like, is also very special in that instead of promoting the idea uh, that it presents a conclusion, it, it, set, it proposes, I think, a set of propositions, and that is like, what can the, cinem what can the cinematic do? Not, not just what is it, but what can it do? And I'm very struck by the fact that the timing of this, as uh, as has also been mentioned, of, of this overlap in the election. And the fact that through Artist Space and then at the Whitney, Laura Poitras show here, and her uh, showing us the real world, the world that is being um, enacted today, and uh, is one way that art functions, is to show us the real world from a particular point of view. So it provides worldviews that we might not have. Like, so that's, so it's, it's, its democratic function is to increase our understanding of the world. But that's not the only way. And the other way, I believe, is to show the unreal, or the possible, or the impossible, or the, and that's, and it's really thematically important. Like, so again, our enemies today want us to not, to imagine there are no other possibilities. And they, they desperately want us to believe that because then we're stuck and we, there's nothing we can do. Not only we can't, well, is our resistance towards them ineffective, but basically we don't have anything else to offer. So the idea of dreams, the idea of dreamlands, the idea of, of science fiction, of other worlds, of, of the, the, of, yes, of those themes, I think is a, a political statement and it comes at just the right time in comparison and in companionship with the other great show 
up right now, which is the Kerry James Marshall Show, which is a show that I recommend everybody see, which also shows us a real world and um, that's, all, that's very, from a very particular point of view, that's really important. And, and we need both these things. We need art to do both these things desperately now more than, now more than ever. So I, I apologize for going on and on about that. And I'll try to go through quickly my own slides. But, but I just felt like an urgency of saying, saying that today. Um, um, I, I used to think as an artist that my hope was to re reconstruct, encourage, uh, create new possibilities for what I want to do, which is to go and look and think. I want to look at things and think about them. And I wanted to make an idea of, I wanted to make art that could create that possibility in some small way for other people. Um, I have now, after showing my work in public for some time, changed my mind. I, in some sense, I uh, actually now what I want to do is I want to create the possibility for somebody to move around something, around something, and to stand still in relationship to something. And so basically, body language has become the rubric for me for success. For me, it's not somebody saying something complimentary or intelligent or exciting about my work. It's really can I create an opportunity that people might actually want to move physically around something, which I think is a representation of thinking, and to stand still and pay attention to something, which is another representation of thinking and of, of, of the body and the mind experiencing together. So I just go through quickly how that, um, uh, can you go back one slide or two slides? So basically, just to get to the piece that's in the show, I'll start with this. Basically, this was from, uh, 2011, a show I did in collaboration with some other people called Interiors. And basically, my question was like, did it make a difference to look at a painting if you're lying down or standing up? Did the body make a difference? These, this piece, and next slide, are reconstructions of non-art works by Donald Judd that he specifically made for his own home to look at art. And basically, he said this great quote, any place that you have art, you should have a bed so you can take a nap. <laughs> So basically, I tried to like literally uh, create a situation where you could lie down and essentially take a nap. Um, I also, it's surrounded by all women artists because uh, that was an important thing to do um, in relationship to Donald Judd, in my opinion. Um, and, um, and then, next slide, uh, this is also maybe my most uh, aggressive gesture as an artist ever. Uh, this is John Chamberlain, uh, his bed for looking at art, and in which he had made s some of the most evil, uh, anti-misogynist uh, miso films I've ever seen in my life, uh, and, and put them next to his bed. So I instead put uh, this new piece by, or this new refound piece by Chantal Ackerman, um, which is about the oppression uh, of, of uh, society's expectations about women's bodies uh, as a kind of, uh, well, screw you, John Chamberlain. Um, but it was a question like, how does the conditions of the body in looking, does it matter? Does it, and that was my question. Um, does it matter where you are, who's there, why you're there, how, what the position of the body is, and how does this, how does this affect thinking and experience? Next. Um, so then I was thinking about that, the same question about the, the history of abstract film. So abstract film is like something that you're off, was originally often created for very like classically cinematic viewing. The idea that you would sit, stand still for an agreed amount of time, sit still for an agreed amount of time, watch it, and then leave. Um, obviously the world has changed and it seems, and I am very interested in painting and um, and a painting is actually something you don't look at just standing still. You often stand still and move around and stand still and move around. So I wanted to create that situation for abstract film. So I created a piece called The Past Was a Mirage I Left Far Behind. Seven huge screens made out of mirror and cloth upon which are projected a subjective history of abstract film, meaning somebody else put together a uh, programs of abstract film, uh, one-hour programs. And all the pictures, next, 
you can see are all with people in them. And it was the first time I ever have shown, decided, wow, like my work looks way better with the people blocking the view. And like actually that the pieces became the pieces when the people were there and when interrupting them. Um, next. And these, so you can see this dramatically, these pieces created a kind of um, um, action by people. Um, and in that sense, for what it's worth, I felt like that I was excited. Next. Um, and you can see that, that the pieces themselves capture both, both the abstraction and the people in the room. Um, it was a destructive as much as a creative impulse because the projections, the sculptures kind of destroy the, the, painting, uh, the original films. So they were shown in the theater uh, in the original conditions intended also as a kind of corollary and the idea of, of seeing how they could be different and in hopefully that this could point towards, towards them again. Um, next. And then, yes, you can see people thinking and looking, maybe. Um, OK, next. And then that's what one looks like just on its own as a sculpture. Uh, and obviously, you'd need a video to really see it, because it, it was never, there was no image like that standing still. It was constantly images changing. Next. Um, and in general, I guess that I have, uh, you know, the, the, the show, again, this notion of ana the anachronic, I, for me, is like something that, it's just something about me personally, is that I'm, I'm interested in how the past, how the dead, how what's gone in, in, informs me today, and how, how I could learn from it, both where do I come from, and also do they, do they are there any lost answers? Because I feel answerless now. So where do I find answers? Can we find answers in the future? Can we find answers today? Can we find answers in the past? To me, it's very clear there's a lot of answers into the past, in the past for the simple reason that we have suppressed the great, most of the great truths about the past. Like, you know, for example, that this city is basically built upon slavery, which is something that we don't fully admit. Um, you know, the, 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 the uh, textile, tr textile industry which built this, this city at, was built on slavery uh, through the cotton uh, industry. We don't like to admit that, but that's the case. So um, this, I'm interested in recovery of the past, both negative and positive. And this was a project where I got the incredible opportunity to help bring to life the first, ab first abstract artist in the Western Canon, a woman, a woman named Hilma of Clint, who has been, her work has been um, hidden, essentially, for 100 years. And it's a huge challenge to art history, because how, here you have, like, the, perhaps, per, uh, possibly the greatest pioneer of, in the history of abstraction, and she's not in a single book. What do you do? Um, how do you rewrite all the books? It's a good question. Um, I think we should rewrite all the books. Um, but I mean, and keep the old books, too, but get new ones. OK, next, uh, these are two of her paintings from 1915 uh, that are, could, could look like they could have been painted yesterday. Next. And I've been involved with uh, the show's relationship to Weimar is, is very close to my heart because I've been obsessed with a writer named Paul Sherbart. And his, my favorite Paul Sherbart quote is, I became a humorist out of rage, not out of kindness. And um, that sort of says it all to me. But he was a utopianist who believed that all utopias would fail, but we should talk about them anyway. And um, that, to me, maybe there's some hope there. This, so I've been part of a small group of people around the world who, in a totally uncoordinated way, have been trying to recover Paul Schierbart, both in the German and in, the, and in new translation to English. So this is cover the frontispiece of a book I've done with Christine Bergen about his work. On the left is my hand-colored version of the dome of a 1914 building that at the base of it had a special purpose-built movie theater uh, for a kinetoscope. Um, so there's a, a lot of cinematic overlap there. Uh, next. And then just, I'll just tell for just two minutes about the, the piece itself that's in the show. So I wanted to, um, I wanted to, instead of making just a screen that could offer ways of viewing. I wanted to make something that like, had a, its own, own um, imagery. 
And so I thought, how could I do that? And I thought, well, maybe by taking lost historical footage, and especially something that I'm interested in, the relationship of uh, surrealism and abstraction, of the body and abstraction, the idea that normally we think of abstraction as sort of without the body, but I'm interested in the idea of abstraction with the body or of the body, um, as like in Oscar Schlemmer's amazing piece upstairs. Um, so uh, Maya Darren had the, the great uh, filmmaker, one of the things that she did that was kind of um, strange and interesting to me as an artist is that she often abandoned works. She essentially threw them out or disavowed them um, or remade them and disavowed the previous one. So there are some uh, interesting footage that is not her work, but it's still her work. So this piece I, is uh, called Projection Painting 2. I took um, uh, just from a DVD uh, uh, projected um, this clips of uh, her film called Ensemble for Somnambulists, which she remakes a year later as her great last film. Um, but this film is, is, is a sort of not a non-film um, and projected on a screen and filmed it with a film crew from many different angles, so distorting it. Next. And it's all about bodies uh, dressed in uh, um, black on a white background, filmed in reverse with reversal film, and and I created a, a fractured structure uh, on which not only my distorted versions of her shots are projected, but then they're further distorted, both frontally, but they become more distorted as you move left and right. And so basically, it's like looking at a painting and the way light changes and the way it's constantly changing depending on you looking at it. And not, not just like, like as a trick, like a lenticular screen, where when you stand to the left, it's one image, you stand to the right, it's another image, but actually where there's something, something more um, open-ended happens as you move your body around. So next, and you can sort of see, sort of see stills from this. Um, next. And it's a sort of, so it's a paint, paint it's, a, it's a painting, it's an object that has moving imagery on it. Next. And so the projector is made out of the same material, the projector housing is made out of the same material as the, um, as the, um, the exterior of the frame because it's part of the piece. So it's an experiment, exp an experiment in how, how, how do you look? Thank you. Thank you, Josiah. Uh, I'd now like to introduce our final two speakers, um, uh, Andrea Monti and Al Burchill. And um, they are my wonderful collaborators from Microscope Gallery on Dreamlands Expanded, which is uh, part of Dreamlands and the most extraordinary program that the two of you put together. Just extraordinary. Uh, so I really want to deeply thank you for that. And um, the Dreamlands Expanded program is part of Dreamlands, just as the 14 film, pro film screening programs uh, that um, I hope you uh, saw, a lot of you, are also part of the exhibition. Um, and so Andrea and Al are co-directors of Microscope Gallery, which they founded in Brooklyn in 2010. The gallery presents the work uh, of artists working primarily with moving image and sound and performance and other time-based arts, and they have regular exhibitions as well as uh, weekly uh, event series of screenings and live sound performance readings and lectures. Um, and through Microscope, they've curated more than 60 exhibitions and nearly 400 events. And most recently, um, the Dreamlands expanded, uh, as I mentioned before, um, was their collaboration with us, as well as other events that they still managed to do somehow in, in between the Dreamlands events, uh, too. So um, thank you both for being part of the panel, and um, congratulations thank again you. to extraordinary works. So um, I guess we'll just get right into it, because uh, time, I think, is running. Um, so for Dreamlands Expanded, um, we put together... Uh, 10 events of mostly solo expanded cinema performances, both historical and current, running from 1922 to the most recent was just on January 15th, which we'll see, brand new composition for this uh, octopus collective of over 30 artists. Um, 
The works in the program are arranged from a colored shadow play created through a hand-built uh, machine. This is a Bauhaus Weimar piece to a study of complete darkness as experienced through the retinas and body to the live disintegration of a photographic slide to 3D effects recreated by means of outdated technologies um, and many others, addressing, among other concerns, the materiality and ephem ephemerality of the filmic image and the cinematic apparatus, visual and sensory immersion, and a broadening of the concepts of screen, projection, audience, and meaning. Um, expanded cinema doesn't really have a uh, concrete um, definition. It's something that's been debated. We had a um, panel last year um, at our gallery at, following an expanded cinema exhibition where we had people who, who are actually making these works try to have a conversation about it. And um, I mean, it, it's, uh, you can see some of it online and it uh, was no, no success in defining it at all. Um, because the artists working with these mediums are more concerned about um, uh, breaking and each person is doing things in their own way. So, um, but uh, what we did in order to present these kind of works was uh, we chose to keep our space white, um, keep our floor uh, light color, and allow it to be used in any way, in any direction, of, uh, as surfaces for whatever type of works we were showing even with a kind of open uh, situation where all equipment is portable. Um, often artists have their own equipment too, or um, what's, what's the other element? Uh, you can go through uh, the Also first seating, slide. you know, where seating can just go anywhere. Uh, we still had two events that we had to, uh, we're lucky to be able to do offsite with um, another venue that had, could meet some of the other concerns of the space. So, um, this is from Actually, the final uh, event, uh, Optipus Collective at Knockdown Center. Uh, they used uh, 50 feet of uh, screen surface, and they had uh, 30 different artists and a huge amount of uh, equipment. Could you go to the next slide? Uh, <laughs> some of which was actually completely unique, modified machines, um, all kinds of outdated uh, analog systems. Um, so... so so we're going to um, address some of the works, part of the series, especially in terms of space. Uh, next slide, please. <laughs> this is um, uh, Black Space, uh, a piece uh, Ken Jacobs uh, first conceived in 1976, and he has been presenting only a few times over the years. Um, and it's always a little different, um, but it requires... Um, complete darkness, or at least attempt at creating uh, the theoretical complete darkness. If you see, there's a red dot there, which means that we failed, <laughs> basically. Uh, but uh, it wasn't yeah. easy. It, this, this time was a little different. We had pre presented the piece before, and this time it also included a presentation. So there was a lot of equipment in the room for the part that happened right afterwards which was involved screenings of works. And so that little red dot is uh, like the speaker light. Like, but um, in order to do this piece, we really blacked out everything in the room. In, uh, because in normal theater, the idea of the theoretical dark space is that it's, there's always exit lights. There's always some kind of light coming from somewhere. But in this space, um, uh, except for that little light, I believe, we did manage to black it, black it out. Um, in an idea that you lose all, con all uh, sense of space, at which he then recre recreates through um, various sound signals. And then the film itself was created through a flashing strobe light um, that creates uh, images on your retina. It's that bright that, it, that you look around and then the light is everybody's individual um, cinematic experience of what they're catching with the eye. Um, sorry. I hope that I was heard there. So basically, we had to make the space disappear at some, at some level and create the sense of loss of uh, spatial uh, references for you know, the performances around 40 minutes normally. OK, I think we can go to the next. Yeah. This is a piece by uh, Bauhaus artist uh, at the time, Kurt Werfeger. 
made in 1922. Uh, it's an actual uh, apparatus, apparature, that we had to rebuild uh, based on uh, film documentation of the piece. Uh, it's an eight by eight by eight structure. You can go to the next slide. Um, there, there are 11 spotlights and a keyboard connected to the, to the lights, and uh, it's within a structure where actually the performers are uh, contained, activating those uh, wood panels in front of the cutout shapes. Um, next slide, please. So you see the cube and the screen in front of it, just a few inches uh, away, to allow for an offset of the images. Also, the, the shapes themselves are made on various screens that alter throughout the performance. So those, what you see on the left there are other shapes. They're, no, they're in the container when it actually happens. Um, but I think we should mention here that Kurt Schwertfeger's um, piece was another, was a piece that was disappeared from history. He made the piece in 1922, and then uh, the following year somebody, um, I guess you could say, appropriated his piece or took his piece in a different direction, which that piece ended up not much of a different direction, but uh, went down in history, um, but often using the imagery from Schwertfeger's piece. Schwertfeger was also later, um, um, his other work was officially declared degenerate art um, in Nazi Germany. And only um, in 66, he kind of we started talking again about this piece and documented it, decided to do another performance with his students, and his son helped him put it together. And at that time, they um, uh, uh, suddenly someone decided, why don't we film this? And he, he actually died two weeks before it happened. But that's, that's where a lot of this, this documentation we were able to reconstruct it from. But the idea is it's a total self-contained uh, theater with back, backlight projection and performers happening inside. Um, a colored shadow play. Based on the size of the, of the original size, or at least the one presented in 1966, which is eight or seven feet uh, cube, we can imagine that the piece was destined to an intimate room. In, in fact, it was first presented at Vasily Kandinsky's house. Um, so, yeah. At the La Lantern Festival. Um, Slide, please. You can see the different surfaces. Um, next, please. Oh. So this is um, our rendition of uh, Steam Screens. This is behind the scenes glimpse at uh, the test the day before it actually happened in the daylight. Um, and for this one, we had to go off site because uh, we originally were told that it was um, possibly to recreate it in our, in our gallery because we had steam heat. But it quickly became clear through talking with Joan that uh, we would have been like in a rainstorm um, if, we, <laughs> if we had done it in our space. Um, so do you want to move on to what it looked like? Do you want to? Yeah. Nice. So here's some uh, footage of the actual night. Um, in this one, you don't see the film so much. You just see the color being blown. We have to say that uh, in addition to... to um, the uh, ideas that Joan had mentioned and you discussed, um, this had never happened in a 25 mile per hour uh, wind advisory <laughs> event before. And um, there was concerns whether or not it, it would function, right? But it, it absolutely uh, is what the piece is about. It actually made it more clear that the piece is the rising and falling and in the wind and it's about how it disappears and um, if you'll see in some of the images, gusts of wind would carry it like 3D, you know, just across the, the space. And despite it being freezing cold and snow starting to happen at the end, um, every, I mean, it was warm. The, the heat itself was warm. So in addition to be a visual experience, it was also um, very physical in terms of uh, sound. You could hear the whistling of the steam along with the soundtracks and... Um, there were six projectors. Uh, we had six projections on four different screens. Um, the piece is uh, site-specific um, and depends on many, many considerations of where the space actually happens. Um, did you want to say something more on this? No. Um, 
Well, yeah, I mean, in this case, we are dealing actually with an actual natural space instead of indoor. We have to uh, consider the elements, whether it's going to uh, possibly rain or not. The temperature is very important for, to allow this theme to be, to be as visible as possible. Um, the wind also, which turned out to be a very important uh, element. Well, the idea in these is that the artists themselves often don't know what's going to happen. Um, there, it's more like a... Uh, rarely do they get time to um, rehearse because of the of the way things are going. Artists don't have a, a steam truck, you know, sitting outside the house to practice with. So um, it's only at the time that they you first turn on the steam, which we did the day before, that you could even figure out certain situations of where projectors might go. But in any of the works, as as Andrea was saying about um, the black space. Um, Ken is evolving the work, um, partly because uh, some of the first performances are the first time they've ever seen it themselves. So, or they add elements or they subtract elements just like anybody else making a piece, but they're not fixed. And um, you also can't ever capture the piece unless you're there. Um, there's no, uh, no video footage will ever capture, uh, maybe with 3D, 360, but uh, so far, what we've seen of the 360 footage, it, it you know, it can't definitely can't capture the experience of steam. Um, so these are very ephemeral uh, works where people have to be here. Also, in these works, the people became are a very important part too, where the people themselves um, are supposed to interact with the steam. They become part of the screens. Okay, so. I want to mention, um, briefly um, address this piece by Takahiko Imura, uh, Circle and Square, made in 1981, um, because he actually acknowledges the difference, very, the difference between theatrical uh, setting and gallery setting, and that actually influences the structure of the piece, uh, as in the gallery, in the gallery version, uh, we have two projections uh, in, in opposite direction, instead of one. Next slide. We presented this, yeah, in the gallery version with two separate projections, uh, where actually, yeah. Well, so we should say what this piece is. This is a piece that involves um, a black leader. So the room starts also off in darkness, but, and then uh, eventually there's a hole punched, and a single circle of light appears, and then there's two circles of light, and three circles of light, and four, and then it goes on and on until a rapid... Uh, ending crescendo when the film itself is broken. Um, in the theatrical version, it, the projection's forward, so when it breaks, there's a square of light of the frame of the projection. In this version, both are happening simultaneously. In one direction, you're getting the circle. The other, you're getting um, the square of light at all times. Um, uh, and the shadow of the performer. Yeah, the shadow of the artist himself. Uh, <laughs> next. Oh, some of the works were um, also installations, involved installation elements like uh, Jennifer West. Um, this is, was not seen by anybody. This is behind the scenes with the lights on. Um, in this work, there's, this is the smallest version of this piece that's ever happened. It's called Flashlight, film strip flashlight um, pro yeah, projections. And it's activated by the audience themselves with uh, several flashlights to create the uh, project the images themselves. Um, however, in the smaller version, sh uh, for the first time, because of our white ceiling, she was able to use the, expand along the whole entire surface of the, of the room. Yeah, she's actually very excited of the possibility to, sh to project onto the ceiling and floor as well, as we're seeing here. Yeah, um, I'm not sure how we are with time. Okay, so the last thing we just wanted to say was in our... Um, Oh yeah, here's a piece from Barbara Hammer. Um, in which, yeah, just continue. These are just some looks at some of the other works. This piece by Sarah Halper, and we had a night of uh, eight, eight performers, which is often how these happen, where you ha all the artists have to rapidly switch over to the next, and involve three room configurations. But um, this piece by Carolina Rosinski. Um, expanded 
the performance across the ocean uh, through Skype. So light was transferred via mirrors from the artist to people in the room, um, you know, like ricochet of light. We can end it there if you want to. <laughs> thank you very much, and thank, thank you to everyone um, for your contributions. I do also want to, um, to mention the film program, um, including the Afrofuturist film program and the Pain Revisited film program. Uh, there were two very important um, screening programs that occurred as as part of uh, the show and the African-American uh, um, contribution to the show is very important and the second one, Pain Revisited, which is very much a very sort of political program, occurred just at the uh, two days after the election and I just want to acknowledge that part and, uh, you know, that's, that was a very critical part of the show. Um, the body is uh, seems key to so many of the... Um, the, the works and the, the ideas that everyone has mentioned. And maybe I'll uh, sort of address that through what you mentioned, Juliana, which is the relationship between absorption and immersion. You, you, you talked about that difference. I wonder if you could maybe start by talking about that, since sure. that also seems so um, critical to everything that everyone's mentioned. Um, y yes, I think, I mean, I think it, that, um, one of the interesting things you did was to sort of uh, make it clear that there isn't one way to think <laughs> about this and and, uh, and immersion and especially in, um, change the way in which of people often think about it, which has to do with uh, with only with technologies or virtual reality and and uh, talk about the kind of historical span of of some of these ideas and how different they also may be, uh, not only in terms of what immersion is, but also in terms of the, some of the the, the complicated connections between absorption and and, uh, and immersion and um, so for for me one of the things that was interesting besides the idea of of, of immersion is that it was not pleasing not attractive as as often or is intended to be or considered to be but in fact there's a kind of challenge to the to the senses and to uh, shocks to the body as you went through the exhibition. Uh, I think some of my students were exhausted <laughs> at the end. <laughs> There's something uh, really uh, connecting very much even to uh, kind of you know, early Walter Benjamin's ideas about how all of these uh, forms of perceptions actually have an impact on the body, to go back to your idea of the body. But uh, what I was also struck by is the uh, idea of absorption, not in terms of Michael Fried, but uh, what I mean by absorption is something closer to what you, Josiah were talking about, which is to say, for me, uh, what was also interesting is that uh, among the differences that showed up in the exhibition, it was also a mode of address of the body of the spectator, which was really about psychic absorption and concentration. So it wasn't just about this kind of distracted, you know, we're immersed in all these things and move around everywhere, but, but a, a recovery and a rethinking of what you were discussing in terms of this idea of looking and thinking. Um, and so I was, and that's why in a way I concentrated on some of these uh, situations, that is to say, instead of the kind of multi-screens or, or, or make a connection between that idea, the fact that you can move around, but at the same time, I think what's really important now is also to, uh, to, go, to go back to this notion of slow time, slow space, being absorbed in space, being able to perceive in that particular way in relation to a work, to stop and think. And it's no longer the way we used to think about it. You know, the cinema is a space where people don't move, and the art gallery is a space where people just pass through. That's also over as an idea. So I think this, that's why, in a way, rethinking about this relation and rethinking about also how, you know, and that's why I was quoting Roland Barthes, the space of the cinema is not immobile, uh, even if the spectator does not move. There are different ways in which one moves. One moves psychically, one moves emotionally, one moves in terms of affect, one moves in terms of weather, you know, sensing the, the, the atmosphere as weather, which is tactile, 
and as well as has to do with sounds. So this, that's, that's what I mean. There's a kind of haptic psychic absorption, which to me is an important, I mean, speaking about you know, what we need today, uh, I think this is crucial uh, to sort of critical thinking in that respect and, and being able to reflect in this way is becoming to me much more important than this kind of you know, being in, in kind of, uh, I hate to use my word, surface level space because the surface, uh, when it is, when you're absorbed in it and when it absorbs you is in fact about traces of memory, imaginations, uh, forms of projections of that imagination. And, and that is, is crucial. It's not just what's really being shown, but also imagining it through, through also through connections with, to the past because it is about, um, in many ways, I think, uh, the potentiality that's inscribed uh, in these surfaces of absorption, not just what was done, but what is possible. And I think in order to have that, to me, it's becoming more and more important to think about the spaces of projection as also spaces of that kind of haptic uh, psychic absorption and collective one, you know, so not individual, but like in, in, in relations to others. I mean, what, you, what you just said um, makes me think of what you said, Dora, about um, uh, the visitor's body as an event, um, and also the, the idea of the work almost being like a body that reacts to physical presence, and so there's a sort of interactivity there. Mm. Um, that is an, an adjusting itself, adjusting itself to new bodies, new presences. So could you maybe say a little bit more about those uh, ideas in relation to maybe what Juliana's mentioned? Yeah, uh, so I think it's present actually thinking ab about kind of that way of approaching the show and, and making body more aware of itself throughout the show. It, it shows in, in many of the pieces, uh, starting from, you know, when when your hands protrude through the light describing the cone, kind of it points, everything kind of points back at you. Uh, also, even with the heat of space, it becomes virtual space, but you are very well aware, aware, even more aware of the material of your own body. Mm -hmm. And also, yeah, I mean, with my, uh, with my piece, with the uh, destruct film piece, where you actually physically walk on the film. Uh, so I think that the show, works in an interesting way where all of this yeah, idea of immersion is not about losing oneself mm. in the, in the mm. usually, usually like in the cinema, you know, where you kind of forget, uh, like Robert Smithson says, uh, you kind of forget about these two hours of your life and you live it through something else. This is actually kind of more about uh, actually being present in this moment. And uh, also, I think that interesting thing with the pieces is that they trigger a lot of kind of memory and narratives that run through multiple pieces. Uh, so there are numer numerous ways of constructing kind of your own narrative and reading of the show, which is, again, kind of like a very active spec spectator um, position. No, I was very struck by what you said when you were describing the three three the three categories of the cinematic and when you talked about the domestic and when you talked about the gallery as being part of that domestic space or that domestic experience and th that you know art is really sort of that elevated form of um, those devices which are our, our servants and, and certainly the works in the show uh, don't really many of them participate in that kind of um, um, sort of ec economic sort of capitalist structure of objects. And, uh, and I think that the idea of the body and the, 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 the phantasmagoric that you, you talked about um, being sort of the opposite of that. Um, I wonder if you could sort of maybe say something about the domestic and the, the, the servants that these screens are in relation to a, fa a phantasmagoric experience that is... That is more along the lines of what everyone's been describing and it's not something passive and it's not something that sort of takes you off into it's not escapist it's actually almost political and i wonder if because of your work um um with the the, the 20s and 30s and your work with schlemmer and uh, other because uh, what has i also said about the the show uh, not following uh, linear time being a chronic uh, whether you could um 
maybe say something about what what might strike you about the, that those previous historical moments and this one. There, uh, how many hours do we have? <laughs> the it, it, it is, to my mind, a, a crucial question, and uh, there are too many ways to address it to address it adequately here. But I'll, I'll say a few quick words first. If I were to intervene uh, po you know, polemically, I would say that these categories are without, in and of themselves, without political value. And the cinematic can be good and it can be evil. The domestic can be good and it can be evil. The phantasmagoric can be good and it can be evil. And invariably, once it is successful, it will be mobilized toward evil. So no, there is no inherent resistance in any of these uh, operations, dispositives, modes. And I, I for one, um, would never assert you know, the phantasmagoric as a positive alternative. Phantasmagoria, in fact, I, part of my intervention is to redeem the word phantasmagoria, which at least since Marx, uh, and Marx was by no means the first, has become you know, the, 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 uh, the catch-all for capitalism and for spectacle. Um, so phantasmagoria is a dirty word in, in critical theory, and I'm trying to recuperate it not as a positive, but as a neutral. Mm -hmm. right. um, the, so that's the, that's the first point. The second point follows uh, all too closely, uh, which is a figure like Schwemmer, in whom I've invested you know, years of my life, uh, and whose work I find endlessly fascinating. In the uh, recent retrospective uh, in Stuttgart, one of the items on display, and it you know, was known to scholars, but you know, there, there it is, is a letter that, uh, that Schwemmer pens in the late 30s or 40s to Goebbels, explaining to him why he is a good Aryan artist and why he shouldn't be subject to the same uh, uh, restrictions as all of these degenerate artists. And that should be hard to swallow. Uh, he was blindfully apolitical, uh, and in spite of the fact that in his, in his earlier days at the Bauhaus, he writes, uh, he describes the Bauhaus as a socialist cathedral, which will lend, put it in hot water for the rest of its existence. So on the one hand, there's this slip up from the early 1920s, which is never buried completely. And on the other hand, there's Schlemmer you know, trying to get in with the good graces of Goebbels, um, as a good Aryan artist. The, the, the work, I deeply believe that the work that Schlemmer does has incredible political agency, but maybe not for his time. Right? By, the, by, the, by the time Schlemmer's work comes to the fore, um, in the very early days, in the late teens, early 20s, there's enormous openness. And I think it, it is made in that spirit of what Josiah referred to as other possibilities and other worlds. And if anything is otherworldly, it's those figures by Oscar Schlemmer. So he really, to my mind, is, is uh, a paradigmatic figure of merging other worlds and our own worlds. How do we get a direct firsthand experience of aliens? Right? Well, go see Oscar Schlemmer's triadic ballet. And that is, that is as close as you can get to another world in our own. Um, and for me, what is crucial, of course, is his fusion of technologized bodies and technologized image space. Or to use in the language of Benjamin, referred to on a number of occasions here, he describes, I think he instantiates the fusion of uh, image space, Bildraum, and body space, Leibraum, through technique, through technology. And that that fusion is very much at play for for uh, Benjamin, it's clear where the, the utopian potential is. It's cinema. Today, if it has utopian potential, it's in this curious obsolescent mode. And I think that much of the phantasmagoria may very well uh, have the new potential. And, and again, I would say it is in and of itself not good. Um, in fact, it's being mobilized overwhelmingly for evil. I think the idea that you know, we all, I'm sure, just read that Google, th you know, Google, do no evil, just threw a party for the Republicans in the Smithsonian um, to court uh, the new powers. Uh, but Google Glass and all of these things that construct augmented reality, which is being played in a, a number of very subtle, very interesting ways throughout the exhibition, uh, the information that's going to drive that is going to be corporate information. Uh, and that's front and center in Hito's work. It's, uh, it's, it, I think it's available in a, in, in a variety of ways throughout the exhibition. So 
if phantasmagoria is, not, is neither good nor bad, how do we begin to think about it? And, and, and again, I just want to turn to something Josiah said, which is this idea of the anachronic. And the book that is affecting me most right now is a book uh, by Ernst Bloch, Heritage of Our Time, published in exile in 1935, mostly from writings in the early 1930s, and it is a chronicle of the rise of fascism. It is a horror story for intellectuals, and, and quite literally in that uh, you know, he's goes into exile and many of the people and discussions in that book end up dead uh, as, as a result. Um, but the, the core theoretical concept of that book is the idea of the simultaneity of the non-simultaneous. Mm -hmm. And that in any given present, there are many different temporalities at play, very different epochs at play. And that we can't, this was especially pronounced in Germany after, you know, in, in Weimar Germany, where you still have pockets of the country that are living as if it's the, you know, the you know, certainly the Kaiser period, but even you know, earlier, um, that we're, these are archaic forces that are real. They're much more real than cinema uh, for much of the country. And there are other forces that belong to a different period. And in, you know, in Jameson's appropriation of this, Postmodernism, the difference between modernism and postmodernism is that everything is now simultaneous. Capital has made everything simultaneous. I think that's not true. Not true. I think that what we've discovered, uh, and for many of us, for, I will speak personally, for me it was a frightening discovery because I did not think that Trump could possibly be elected. But for me, uh, it was a discovery that in fact there are huge, not little tiny pockets, but huge swaths of this country that belong to a completely different present. And so what, what I am experiencing now firsthand is the simultaneity of the non-simultaneous. Um, I think the, the, the huge scope, 1905 to 2016, but with real anchors and roots going back centuries even further, the exhibition allows us to experience that simultaneity, the simultaneity of the non-simultaneous. And I think that experience, experiencing of it, and this is what got Bloch into such trouble with his colleagues, for, for Bloch, this was a seed of hope. And of course, for his colleagues, I think there is no hope here. Um, or to paraphrase Kafka, there's infinite hope, only not for us. Um, the, uh, the, I, I still believe, and I may be falling into the exact same trap as Bloch, but I still believe, and I think Josiah still believes, um, that there is hope in that non-simultaneity um, and potential in that non-simultaneity. So, when I think about Schwemmer, I think of someone who failed completely politically in his life, and yet, in the context of this exhibition, perhaps there is yet hope. Thank you, Noam. Um, I'm aware that we're running out of time, so maybe um, there are other three speakers we can draw in in um, relationship to what the um, hi and what the audience. Sorry, I realise I've been not facing you for all of this time. Um, um, ideas and thoughts and questions that the audience might have. So. Um, I'd like to throw, throw it open to all of you now. Um, does anyone have questions or thoughts, uh, thing, things to ask all the speakers, or things they want to say? Yes. I'm so curious to hear from you. Um, you know, we're talking about all these experiences of immersion and um, uh, simultane simultaneity and, and the non-simultaneous. There are so few spaces um, where we have communal experiences like the one um, that we're present in uh, in this moment. And you know, uh, in the domestic space, less and less of us are engaging um, in places where we have communal cinema. Um, what's possible for us? What is the potential of, of, of communal experience of cinema um, in this moment? Of cinema or the cinematic? Do you mean? I mean, I think that the irony is that, that actually um, there's a sort of return to cinema um, as an experience, that, that a communal experience of the kind that you're having now, where you know you sit frontly and you you know you watch something that has a beginning, middle, and end, and then you leave. That that sort of more conventional cinema is actually uh, has been pulled back from the brink in a certain way. I also think that television. Um, and the sort of episodic viewing um, of um, other kinds of cinema, if you like, or television, are, are, are really very strong. So in terms of a communal, communal viewing in physical space, I think that the conventional cinema, certain, certain moments in conventional cinema are, are kind of being you know, re, re, 
reasserted. Um, but in terms of um, shows like Dreamlands, they very rarely occur in American museums or New York museums or museums in general, but especially in America. They're very, the thematic shows like this one um, are very hard to do. They're very expensive. They're very space-hungry. Um, and they're, they're, they're very challenging on, on all, in all respects. And, you know, I'm deeply thankful to my director, Adam Weinberg, for allowing me to do this show, especially since he didn't even know exactly really what it was when he <laughs> said yes. Um, <laughs> whether he would have said yes if he'd known, I'm not sure. But, yeah, he really, he really there's a lot of trust there. And um, because some of these works, including Dora's, were, were made, we didn't see it until it was installed. Um, we saw it in the studio uh, in, in various various moments, but you know the, the the levels of trust with the artists and and scholars and and you know I've had intense discussions with everyone on this panel about the ideas in the show for a long time. So um, there's a lot of dialogue, and the, the show is rooted very much in the, the community. Um, uh, and you know I, I think in terms of what are the what are the the possibilities for collective cinema cinematic experiences. I mean, you know, it's up to everyone, um, the artists and, and also curators, to, to, to create those and to, to kind of um, take forward other... I mean, to me, exhibitions are always there. One, one of the, the important things they're there for is to kind of open up other um, um, ideas and to, 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 to stimulate people into asking other questions, to critique things that it didn't address, to try and find ways of maybe approaching those things in other shows, other events, so. I should say, am I still on? Oh, we do screenings pretty much every week. Um, and there's lots of other venues in, especially in Brooklyn, um, of people doing documentary, Union Docs, Light Industry. Um, Mono Noawari does a series. Um, Millennium Film <laughs> Films is, it, Workshop is regenerating. Anthology Film Archives. Screenings. I mean, there there is many many places. Whitney does screenings. Mama does screenings. There's lots of places where you can gather and, and watch stuff um, from emerging to experimental stuff that we're doing to uh, more mainstream things. Yes. I just, on? Yeah. I just wanted to add to that that um, you know there, there's something different between watching something on a screen and watching it in common you know, or with, with others. And I think that I, I was struck by, uh, you know, Juliana referenced the Kubelka's uh, Invisible Cinema and the sort of way that you get the associations to a privatized uh, present experience of, of kind of looking at your screen and, and this compartmentalized experience. But I was also struck by thinking about that and what Josiah said about, you know, Donald Judd's famous thing about the bed and thinking, you know, Stan Vanderbeek, uh, in addition to the steam screens and the and the movie mural and stuff, also had this wonderful project of dream screens, right? That mm -hmm. that 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 would have everyone actually in a big sleepover with fifty or a hundred people, and you would have um, films screening all night to kind of create this social space and create this common space. And you know, I just want to say, having uh, gone to I think pretty much every every one of the, the works in the Dreamlands Expanded program, I, I can attest to an incredible uh, kind of sense of com communality amongst many of the audiences there. Uh, things like Barbara Hammer's Evidentiary Bodies, um, steam, uh, the Vanderbeek steam screens, uh, all of us kind of freezing out in the cold and, and wind. And you, you have these, and the hundreds of people at the Octopus uh, performance with you know, 30 artists on stage, it, you could really feel a, a sense of, uh, you know, community is a, an, an abused word, but uh, this sense of commonality, perhaps, in view, viewing in common, mm -hmm. that was something more and something more corporeal, like Josiah was saying, it has to do with a body uh, m moving around in a space with others and having that commonality that is over and above just the visual or the audiovisual experience of the, uh, of, the, of the works being displayed. So I just wanted to call attention to that and again congratulate the, uh, the Dreamlands Expanded for, for all the work and, and Christy for supporting them because I think that that was such an important part of this, this program and making connection. Thank you. Yes. Hi, thank you. Is this working? Okay. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, thank you, and thank you especially to Gnome for um, reminding us that none of these dispositives, as you've defined them, has um, a certain 
purchase on the political or on good politics. Um, I was wondering if it seems to me that it's also unlikely that any of them has uh, claim to uh, the aesthetic or good aesthetics. And I'm, I'm uh, reminded largely because Juliana Bruno uh, insisted, and I think rightly, that immersion is not the same as, as absorption in a Freudian sense. But I was wondering then if we're um, ostensibly uh, maintaining our, our critical and aesthetically critical faculties as we want, wander around this exhibition, what um, uh, what sort of, uh, how to say this, what rubric or um, mode of assessment, mode of aesthetic assessment do we have uh, in, in an exhibit like Dreamlands um, if absorption is no longer necessarily a, a quality, um, an aesthetic category uh, that redeems a work as good or if, um, I don't think we can say along the lines of um, Rosalind Krauss that uh, that uh, a discursive engagement with the cinematic necessarily makes it uh, makes the art work uh, aesthetically good, um, largely because there's so much installation art in in this exhibition, and that's sort of Krauss's um, antagonist in that in that essay. Um, and so I was wondering if if there was um, if any of you, especially the um, especially Noam and Juliana, if you had some approach to, um, I guess, what we might call the dilemma of, if not the formalist, then the sort of post-Greenbergian critic in an exhibition like this. <laughs> Rock, paper, scissors. Huh? <laughs> Rock, paper, scissors. <laughs> the, the, I mean, on, on some level, I think we, we have to say that this is not an exhibition, as, best, as far as I can tell, for the post-formalist critic, right? And, and there is a uh, there are, there are such severe limits to that tradition, mm -hmm. however much we may have learned from it, that I don't think we have to answer or this exhibition has to answer to that tribunal. Um, that is my first uh, response. So my second response is this exhibition and the, the the criticism and the art and the scholarship on which it builds offer up different criteria. Right? They offer up other criteria by which to encounter art, which include many things, and I can't possibly do it justice in, in an extemporaneous 30-second response, but I do believe there is a you know, human sensorium engaging technology core which matters so much more than formalism to aesthetics, to human experience, to politics, to modernity. Um, you know, there's the idea that, for example, Benjamin could belong somehow to that first tradition is a joke. Right? He had no interest in that. Um, the, uh, uh, the, it, he, he says, for example, how disappointed he was in Wolfling right? and takes nothing from, uh, from that formalist, that or formalist art historical tradition. So I think that uh, the, maybe someone else can, can better weave the question into the exhibition, but I think we, we do the question a disservice by trying to integrate it, and I think better to say there are other criteria, and the exhibition is one of the better interventions into establishing what those other criteria might be. Uh, I agree with Noam uh, entirely. I, would, I wouldn't want to uh, enter you know, that in the least, and, and I also think that in many different ways ask, I mean, to, to say, I think, I mean, from not interpreting what you were saying, but to say that something is neither good or bad per se does not mean that, uh, it, it means rethinking those categories, not saying that it's outside uh, of that in any way, shape, or form, yes. because technology by itself can be used in many different ways. So it's not really either the technology or even the space or, or the cinema as it is or this or that that does something. And then that's been throughout history. And so that's why, in a sense, I also think this return to understanding the, the anachronistic uh, movements of history is important to rethink even those questions because, in fact, it, it makes us like see what was potentially there, what spaces there, where to open up in different ways and how we can reinvent it. So it's not just about obsolescence or going back to categories, but it's actually rethinking those categories themselves, including uh, the aesthetic. And, I personally have nothing against uh, aesthetics, especially in this uh, vulgar 
uh, world of Trump, I'm sorry. If something uh, looks aesthetically beautiful, there's nothing against that. It's not that that's not political. So I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to, you know, juxtapose that in, in, in any in any possible ways. In the same way that I think, uh, similarly, also to Josiah as well as Noam, that if you're talking about forms of imaginations in a place that cannot imagine, uh, then that's political too, even if at the same, at the, in, the, in the first moment, it may seem like you're not really addressing the question. So it's not the subject, it's not the form, but something else that rethinks them together in different ways in relation also to the anachronism of history and what kinds of potentials and sites of hopes, uh, I, I believe that too, that can open up for us. And that's to me that, that what matters. Thank you. Other other questions or thoughts? Yeah. Hi. Um, I'm wondering, considering the the Whitney, and I don't know about the specific funding for this show, but the various sources that the Whitney and other cultural institutions draw their funding from, many of which also help to elect the president, um, and who support sort of the other reality that Noam was speaking to. Um, how can, how do you as cultural workers and how do many of us in the room, I assume, as cultural workers manage the multiple realities that we're living in where the Walton family funds the Whitney and also funds lots of other things? Um, how do you manage that? And maybe how did you manage that specifically as you continue to work on Dreamland's programming after the election? Um, well, it's, you know, the American government doesn't fund culture. It doesn't fund museums like European museums. So if you're going to have museums at all, um, you need to approach private individuals. So right there you have American culture and America in general. In a nutshell, because, you know, it's hard as a European to understand the sort of extent of the America's disinterest in collectivity or the civitas, you know, um, Oh, it's just hostility, hostility to culture, and that's it. So, so actually, if I say to American friends, um, it's such a, you know, it's it's so frustrating. The American government doesn't fund culture and museums. They say, well, actually, thank goodness it doesn't, because otherwise we'd be in trouble. Um, so, in fact, uh, interestingly, most of Americans I've spoken to sort of actually like that distance, because there is no, you know, in Britain there's a quango, you know, quasi-autonomous non-government organisations who fund it with the Arts Council, and it's, there's more of a sort of, there's a built-in um, sort of buffer between the state and um, um, museums, except the Tate, which of course is a national institution. There are no national institutions except the ones in Washington in America. Every museum is private. Um, like everything else, <laughs> education, healthcare, you know, culture, it's part of the same thing. So, you know, as cultural workers, I don't know how many of you were at the, um, were at the wonderful um, day uh, that Megan actually organized um, uh, here in this room um, on the day of the inauguration. Uh, it was extraordinary, and the number of activists and artists who spoke uh, very vociferously and very passionately, and the number of people who came um, was overwhelming, and, and that was a very clear response on the part of our institution to the situation. Um, we're a cultural institution, we're, we're a museum, uh, so we, we, we try and address um, our thoughts and our feelings and our, our ideas um, through the programming we do and through the, the dialogues with artists that we have. And... Um, you know, the, the, our ethics in general in this period have never been tested. I mean, I don't, you know, we're, we're constantly going back to the 1930s and I, there are many other decades too. I mean, you know, <laughs> it's the last sort of thousand years to contend with. But, you know, our, our ethics have never really been tested. And maybe this moment now is, is maybe the first since, I don't know, I wasn't around in the 60s to, be, you know, Know, know what that must have felt like, you know, marching on Washington in 1963. It was much easier to organize the Women's March um, now because of the social media and the, the speed with which it happened was extraordinary. And to feel one of nearly a million people there was extraordinary. And, um, you know, the, the, you have, to, you have to, to start with your own ethics and how you, how you work and how you think and how you 
um, um, how you actually deal with your community and your communities and then the larger community at large, including the, the general public. And if you can make a show that, that opens up... I mean, you know, most people's re reality, the general public rather than... You know, as, as well as the artistic community, most of people's experience of um, projected imagery is Times Square or very large, very blindingly bright billboards. And it would be it, very problematic if our experience of art consisted of going to galleries, of which I, all of which I respect enormously, but going to galleries to look at objects and then going to out in the street and seeing commercial billboards. And, and, and God help us if the world's reduced to those two binaries. I mean, the show is about the opposite of those binaries. And it's also about introducing another kind of projected, a projective experience, be it very event-driven or more spatially, something you see a, 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 across time as you move through the fifth floor or whether you come to a film screening, all the works offer very different um, um, different realities. So maybe, if you like, we're a, we're a Trojan horse. <laughs> Are there other thoughts or questions? It seems like Okay. Well, I want to thank uh, all the panelists very, very much for for coming, for being such an important part of Dreamland. Um, thank you. And thank you. no. And I would like to thank Megan and Lily for organising the event and for our AV crew. And thank you to everyone for coming. Thanks.